Hey, this is Brett, and uh, today we are going to read one of the short stories from M.I. Blue, coming up from the silence. Uh, this one is called Winnie and Tommy by Francesca Leah Black. The air smelled like muffins baking and about to burn, and the man's voice on the radio sang sweet and hoarse. Tommy drove his yellow Carmen Gia over the bridge into a city that seemed made of honey and charcoal. Winnie thought that she was probably the happiest she had ever been in all her 17 years. She had never had gone she never had to go back to high school. Michael Stipe was singing This One Goes Out to the One I Love. She was in love with the hottest skateboarding guy in Santa Cruz and they were going to spend a whole weekend in San Francisco. There was nobody like Tommy. He could fly on his skateboard. He had heavy-lidded blue eyes and soft lips that made him look like the angels in Renaissance paintings. And he could draw Renaissance angels, cars, portraits, and almost anything else. He wanted to go to Italy to study art. He was tan and wiry, and he knew the names of flowers. He could dance. Animals always came over to him first. He wore the best chunky puppy shoes instead of the narrow weasel shoes that some guys wore. Winnie and Tommy had been going out for a year. They had met at a party at the end of last summer. The air had smelled like beer and trees and had the beginning creep of chill that told everyone school was going to be starting soon. Winnie was drunk on keg beer. She was wearing a tiny black dress and combat boots. She saw Tommy and started dancing by herself nearby, whirring like a frisbee. When she was dancing, Winnie felt the safest, as if no one could hurt her. Tommy danced, too. He could do things like falling into splits and spinning on his back. He and Winnie jammed and slammed, hip-hopping until it was light. Then they went to the beach and she, she sat huddled in a woven Mexican blanket while he surfed. They ate whole grain pancakes in a natural foods place and Tommy left because Winnie could eat as much as he could even though she was tinier than he was. Winnie didn't want to tell, didn't want the time with Tommy to end. When she had to go back to her house she felt the stone of loneliness sinking down through her body again. She had forgotten about it since she and Tommy had started dating. During the whole school year, Winnie and Tommy were always escaping together to skateboard, play pinball on the pier, eat poppy seed cake, look at art books, just drive and drive, listening to music. After a while, they told each other what they were trying to get away from. Winnie said, Our house is like a tomb. It's like my mom died when he did. Winnie's dad was killed when she was 12. He had been an architect and built their house by the sea. He had also built Winnie huge turreted sandcastles and called her his merbaby and given her shells and showed her how, how if you put them in water, all their original brilliant color came back. When she cried, he let her listen to his magical conch and told her to take three deep breaths and promised she would fall into a deep sleep of beautiful uh, deep sea dreams. It always worked. Now there was just her and her mom and whatever new boyfriend her mom brought that night. Tommy said, Your dad probably is still around you in a way. I believe in that stuff. Maybe he's like your guardian angel. Winnie knew what he meant. Once she was driving home from a party drunk and her mom's car spun out and careened across the street but she wasn't hurt at all and the station wagon was only scratched. That was one time she was sure her dad had been around. She never got behind a wheel drunk again after that. She wished someone had been her dad's guardian angel the night his motorcycle crashed. At least you had a father who really loved you, Tommy said. Tell me about your dad. He's a bastard. Winnie ran her fingertips along the lines ridging Tommy, Tommy's forehead. He'd back up the car to the edge of a cliff with me in the back seat. I was like three. He'd just crack up when I screamed. Oh God. And he did things like he told me that if I that I 
that we were going to Europe. He packed my bags and everything. I think I was five. All I really wanted in the world was to go to Europe and see the paintings like in the books. He dressed me up and we went to the airport, right to the gate, and then he starts laughing and saying it was just a joke. That's sick. What did your mom do? She didn't know about it. I didn't tell her. Why? I don't know. I didn't want to upset her. He beat me up, too. He broke my arm once. I told my mom I fell down skateboarding. After that, I wasn't afraid to do anything on my board. Tommy. She saw a flash image of her dad on his bike, eyes hidden under dark sunglasses, square jaw, hands gripping the bars. She stopped the picture there. And then he left, thank God. I wish the reason I can never stay still is because of him. I read that guys who don't have strong father influences feel like they're spinning all the time. I wish I could be your dad, when he whispered into Tommy's hair. We can be each other's dads. They were also each other's moms, making sure that the other had eaten, was dressed warmly enough. Once, while Tommy was teaching Winnie to do a special skateboard jump, he said to her, You're like the son I never had. She loved that. It was better than if he had said, I love you. They won cutest couple in the school yearbook. They went to the prom in matching baggy black tuxedos. Tommy gave Winnie a corsage of orchids that was almost the size of a centerpiece and must have cost him a week's pay from the skate shop where he worked. He said, let's drive to San Francisco the day school gets out. The first place they went in the city was a tiny Japanese restaurant without a name. A line of people drank beers out of paper bags while they stood outside on Church Street, waiting to get in. Tommy asked two handsome men in very soft-looking sweaters if they would purchase some beer for him and Winnie. He had a fake ID, but sometimes it didn't work. The men smiled, and one of them took Tommy's money, went to the liquor store on the corner, and bought two huge Sapporos. He handed the paper bags to Tommy. The beers were pearl dripping with cold, and the caps had been opened but half stuck back on. The man gave Tommy his change. I think the big ones cost more than that. It's okay, said the man looking into Tommy's eyes. Thanks. Winnie scraped her finger on the edge of the bottle cap as she pulled it off. She shivered as the cold, dark beer poured out of the glass into her mouth. She felt her whole body soften. The restaurant was so crowded and small, you could hardly walk inside. There was a mural of shy Japanese women peeking from behind their fans and under their parasols. Some of them were holding babies. A, the tea smelled sweet, like brown rice. Winnie and Tommy ordered hot miso soup, spinach with sesame sauce, and monster-sized California rolls. Seaweed cornucopias of fish and thinly sliced flowery vegetables. After dinner, they walked along the street for a while. There were packs of men everywhere. They reminded Winnie of the view from the city bridge. Beautiful, self-contained, remote. She tried to imitate Tommy's loping boy walk so that she could fit in better. Let's go in here, Tommy said. It was a leather store. There were all kinds of black... Come on, Nadia. She's trying to clean up the bed. It was a leather store. There were all kinds of black leather clothes, tight pants with laces, chaps, halters, studded zippered motorcycle jackets. Winnie tried on black leather shorts, but her zipper got stuck. Tommy had to come into the dressing room to help her. Close your eyes, though, she teased. How can I do it if my eyes are closed? They were both laughing so hard they thought the slim man with the pierced eyebrow would throw them out. Instead, he grinned at Tommy and said, Why don't you take a look downstairs? The basement chamber was full of spiked things, rubber things, leather things that Winnie had never ever seen or even heard of before. Tommy teased her, but... Then he took her hand as they went back upstairs and bought her a black leather rose, which he pinned to her jacket. They drove to the hate. 
The street was lined with stores selling used Levi's, leopard coats, platform engineer shoes, uh, uh, platform shoes, engineer boots, CDs, cappuccino. All the telephone poles and street lights were plastered with flyers for bands. Kids were hanging out everywhere. Winnie and Tommy gave change to a skinny, big-eyed girl who looked like a kitten. Winnie wished that she and Tommy could have a big house someday and fill it up with street kids and cook meals for them, and that there would be enough love to go around without anyone feeling left out. Tommy suggested coffee and sugar. They sat in a cafe, getting wired on caffeine and poppy seed cake. Someone had told them that if you eat enough poppy seeds, your blood would test positive for drugs. They liked to pretend that the cake made them high. When they walked back out onto the street, they heard music. Winnie thought it sounded like Roma's. They sounded to listen. A musician was playing a violin, moving as if completely possessed. The violinist had cafe au lait skin, long dark curls, a beautiful face, and an androgynous body that swayed in a puffed sleeved midriff shirt tight shorts and high pirate boots. The most beautiful people are the ones that don't look like one race or even one sex, Tommy said. When he thought about this, she knew that with her short brown hair, square jaw, and straight up and down body, with her baggy jeans and big shoes, she looked a little like a boy. She thought that Tommy's eyes and lips made him look prettier than she did sometimes. Once she had put mascara on him for fun, and been almost shocked by his beauty. When he pulled his arm, she looked at his face. His eyes seemed far away as if watching a movie different from the one she saw. They walked down the street while the Roma violinist, who was not black or white, man or woman, kept playing the music, clicking its heels and snapping its fingers after them. Winnie wanted to go straight to the hotel, but then they passed a tiny bar and heard blues coming from inside, and they both knew they had to dance. The bar smelled of barbecue and beer. They got in with their fake IDs and danced in a crowd of people in front of a little stage. As she pressed up against Tommy, Winnie thought their two bodies would melt down and merge into one another. She thought about this the whole way to the Red Vic. The Red Vic was just that an old Victorian building painted bright red. There was a movie theater downstairs and a hotel above it. The hotel rooms had special themes, the rainbow room, the rose garden room, the peacock suite. Winnie and Tommy had the flower child room. There were big psychedelic blossoms everywhere. The windows of the room looked right out onto the still busy night street where people spare changed and cars honked, but Winnie felt like she was in another world. A world of yellow daisies and purple peace signs and love-ins, Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin. She went to take a bath. When she got back into the room, smelling of vanilla almond oil and wearing her silk men's pajamas, Tommy was lying on the bed in his clothes, asleep. She kissed his cheek, but he didn't stir. She took off his boots and pulled the covers over him. Tommy, she whispered. He didn't move. Winnie put her arms around him. He was always so warm, like a puppy. His light body got so heavy when he slept. She nestled against him in the flower child room. As soon as they woke up the next morning, Tommy said, I have to go get some coffee in me. He kissed Winnie gently with his soft, full, Italian Renaissance angel lips and got up to bathe. Winnie and Tommy ate croissants and drank cappuccinos in the Victorian-style parlor full of overstuffed furniture. The croissant tasted too rich for Winnie and the coffee too strong. She felt queasy and still sleepy. Her head pounded. Let's get some sun, Tommy said. He was jittery, his knees jumping under the table. Winnie and Tommy walked along the panhandle of the park that rolled like a river of grass, trees, hedges, and flowers on its way to the sea. Everything was as green as parks on a map. The rose garden was Tommy's favorite. His mother had taught him all the names of the roses, and Winnie quizzed him as they walked down the paths in a haze of fragrance. 
snow fire, sterling, silver, smoky, seashell, evening star, sunfire, angel face. They sat on a stone bench and Tommy read out loud to Winnie from Franny and Zoe. Winnie wanted to say, I love you. She could taste the words like frosting on her lips, smelled them like the white roses Tommy knew by name. When they got to Chinatown, the shops were just closing. In the window of the butcher shop, dead ducks spread and dangled. There was a pig with cherries for eyes. Fish flickered on the sidewalk in plastic bags. The bakery was full of plump pork buns splitting with filling. Sticky wedges of rice pastry. Glossy wet white noodles. Flabby on thin paper and sprinkled with what looked like red and green confetti. People hurried out carrying pink boxes that were already staining with grease. Wind chimes and lanterns made tinkling sounds as the shop owners carried them in for the night. The china bowls painted with peonies and cued children. The tasseled hair ornaments, sandalwood soaps and teas and willow jasmine boxes were all swept inside. Everything was lush and lacquered, bloodied and slick with grease broiled and charred and glazed, basted, steamed, sugared. In an upstairs Chinese restaurant, Winnie and Tommy ordered soup and rice and mushu vegetable with plum sauce. They found a smoky bar. It was crowded with guys in low-slung jeans and beer-belly-filled t-shirts playing pool while other guys dressed as women in feathers and sequins watched them. A beautiful black blonde in white satin, winked at Tommy. Winnie didn't know where to look first. I think that angels are like that, Winnie said, admiring a redhead and green sequin G-string. Tommy said, I don't think she would consider herself an angel. You know what I mean. They are so beautiful, more beautiful than men or women. They're like from another world. That's true. Why is it that the ideals women legs only come on men? When he said, admiring some glimmering thighs and calves. Beautiful men women. Legs, lips, mermaid green sparkle spangles. Silver platform shoes. After a while it was almost too much. Tommy took Winnie's hand and they started to run. Winnie was running back to the flower child room, but she felt Tommy running away from the city itself a glam drag queen with roses in her teeth, whose face he did not want to see. When they jumped on the bed, out of breath in the flower room, flower child room, Winnie threw her arms around Tommy and pushed him down on his back. She kissed him, but all of a sudden his body felt cold and rigid. It was like he was someone else. She didn't know him. She tried to stroke his thigh, but he shifted away from her. What's wrong? He shrugged and sat up, then he said, I'm trying so hard. He pounded his fist on the bed. Winnie felt the mattress springs contract as if they were inside her body. What do you mean? I like guys. I've always liked guys. I kept waiting for it to stop, or at least to fall in love with someone the way it is with you. So then I would just have something concrete. But it's just this feeling. I can't make it stop. Winnie stared at him, his face hidden in his hands. She remembered when she saw her mother weeping, crawling on the floor, calling Winnie's father's name. The feeling of being alone started then. It stopped five years later, the first time she danced with Tommy. How can you tell me this? Winnie, Winnie screamed. Her own voice scared her. I'm your girlfriend. If I can't tell you, who am I supposed to tell? My mother? The guys I skate with? You're the only person I can tell. What, I should call my father or something? Tommy stood up. He looked like a little boy in his three waist sizes, two big baggy jeans, and backward baseball cap. Okay, fine. I won't talk about it with you. I should have known you'd act like this, he said. He walked to the door. Where are you going? I have to get out of here. She wanted to run to him and hold him and tell him it would be all right, as if he were her child, but he wasn't. They were both just children. There was nothing she could say. 
Winnie went to the window and waited. She saw Tommy walking down Haight Street, looking tiny and young. She wanted to shout for him to come back, but she didn't. All night she sat huddled in the china in the flower child bed. She tried not to move. It was like uh, if she moved, her heart would somehow detach and slip out of place, floating lost in the cavern of her body, deflating like a punctured stray balloon. She held up a mirror and looked at her face. She really did look like a boy, a puffy-faced boy now. She wondered if Tommy had pretended she was a boy when he kissed her. She wondered if her small breast made him sick. She hated herself. She wanted her dad. But Tommy is right, she heard her dad say. Who else can he tell except you? You're his best friend. Maybe you're his only friend. Tommy loves you. Who else will be able to dance like that? Winnie asked her dad. Who else will give me an orchid centerpiece to wear as a corsage? Who will know exactly which shoes we should both get? Who will draw like that and ride a skateboard like an angel and read out loud to me? No one, her dad said, just Tommy. Well, you'll still have Tommy. You'll have someone else to be your boyfriend. Lots of boys will love you, Baby. That's almost like saying I'll find another dad. It might feel that way. Maybe you will find someone else to be like your dad, but that doesn't mean you don't have me. Winnie lay down in the flower child bed. She pretended that she was on a beach covered with psychedelic daisies, listening to the song of a magical conch shell. She took three deep breaths and fell asleep. Some time later, after so uh, late it was early, Winnie heard the door and opened her eyes. Tommy came into the uh, dark room. He stood in the corner. What happened? Winnie whispered. I went to a bar and danced with some guys. Was it okay? Yeah, but I worried about you. Winnie turned to him. The pillows were still damp with her tears. I don't want you to leave like my dad did. I don't want you to leave like my dad did. I'll never leave you, said Tommy. It will be just a different thing. He moved toward her. It must be the light from the window, she thought, because he was radiant like the angels in his favorite paintings. Maybe it was just because something inside him had opened up. Can I sleep next to you? He whispered. He sounded so tired. Winnie felt the sheets stir as his warm body climbed into the bed. She smelled cigarette smoke and felt through the rough fabric of Levi's brush against her bare legs. Then Winnie and Tommy hugged, wrapped in each other's arms like little children, until they fell asleep. <laughs>